Hi, I'm Peter J. Ray. Welcome to Adventures in History. Today's topic is Dearest Mother, Love Ruthie, Ruth Smallshaw Ray's Letters to Her Mother, 1949, Part 45, 2457 Kenilworth Road, Cleveland Heights, Ohio, October 27th, 1949. Oh, Mommy, Daddy, and Buddy, Sometimes it worries me that I get so many emotional ups and downs. But then I rationalize and say that I really must enjoy them, or I wouldn't allow them to continue and thrive so. But Bud, be sure, dear, that they are not manifestations of genius, but merely indications of poor control emotionally. And whereas the ups are okay, the downs should be censored to a greater degree. John just came over and now is gone. Laughed about all the time he was here because I'm like this. It's so funny. John dreamed last night that he was in Regina at our house and that there were all my relatives there. He said there were about 400 of them. Mommy was sitting playing bridge with three other ladies and all my relatives were waiting their turn to play bridge. He said Bud had lovely wavy hair, Daddy wasn't there, and I was rushing around. He met a tall blonde cousin of mine who was talking in Shakespearean language. His name was Ted. I asked if he enjoyed the trip, but he said all he could remember was the consternation of seeing all these relatives. He told me this on the way to school this morning, and I just about died laughing. The happiness I feel is so wonderful. Everything's nice, the apartment, school, college, everything. Thanks for Daddy's letter. I really enjoyed it and would like to hear from Bud. <clears throat> I still think you all should save up, buy a car, enjoy it in the summer, and next fall maybe drive here for my graduation. I may not graduate, though. There are 126 hours required four-year Bachelor of Science degree in education. I need 130 hours, though, to fulfill requirements. 33 more means I have fulfilled, as of January, 97 credits. They wouldn't count my Florida credits. I wrote history and sociology exams this week and feel I did badly, but I, but I am at least organized to begin work. I bought a pumpkin, took my kitties with me to buy it. We stopped into the dime store, and the manager gave them all free bags of candy and balloons. Wasn't that nice? Thursday, we made a jack-o'-lantern. Muriel brought it home in her car so I could use it for my party. This is now Sunday. Do you know that I was so excited and happy that I couldn't keep my pen moving fast enough to flow along with my thoughts? I couldn't get to sleep until 2 a.m. and woke up at 6 a.m., still wound up. I'll finish this now to tell you the circumstances. Thursday after teaching, being on playground duty, classes and writing and a sociology exam. John met me at 6 o'clock and drove me to the City Women's Club, where I was Mrs. Heinrichs, my principal, guest at the ICEC the International Council for Exceptional Children Dinner. It was $3.15 per person, so very nice of her. Of course, you probably know by now how enthusiastic I get when I attend that type of affair. I feel that I'm part of something big that is really doing some good in the world. They had a minstrel group, a chorus of young colored fellows from one of the schools for delinquents, who were really terrific. Just move you to hear them sing. The speaker spoke on child delinquency. In a study on the causes of delinquency, 88% of the 500 cases studied were caused by the home influence. The community broken homes causes, causes were much less than is usually believed. And as an answer to the heredity versus environment argument as to which is more important, as they say, Whereas you can't do anything about the heredity, you certainly can do something about the environment. Anyway, it aroused my enthusiasm just to be a part of, oh, 
education. And all around, I've never been so deeply satisfied with everything, as I've said fairly often. Well, Friday morning was a holiday from school for our NEOTA meeting convention, Northeastern Ohio Teachers Association. The meeting was in the public auditorium. It seats 16,000 and was filled plus an extra 1,000 in the hall behind the stage. The back of the stage sets down. It's supposed to be the only assembly that size of just teachers and was really inspiring. The Oberlin Band played a wonderful story of America. I'll send you the program. I'd like to get one piece for Bud. Certainly wish he played in a band like it. The main speaker was a lawyer from Kansas. Senator Taft also spoke. At noon, I met Dale, and we bought some doll furniture for my dollhouse at school. Then she took me to dinner at a very nice place called Hector's. She also bought a, bo bought a bottle of wine for us to drink with our dinner. She and Dan are just getting along perfectly. Friday night, Ginny and I ushered at the playhouse. Romeo and Juliet. John called for me, and then we went to the party at the co-op, the opening of the rumpus room in the basement that the boys built. Very nice. Saturday, John helped me clean the apartment and shop for groceries, and then took the little boy where I live and I to our Sunday school Halloween's party. My kitties had a wonderful time. I have seven in my class and all there this morning, too. Well, Saturday evening, I had invited Dale, M.B., Dan, B.A., Architect, Ann, M.A., Social Work, Wayne, B.A., Law Student, Joan, B.S., Education, Lenny, B.S., Education, Bill, B.S., Mary, B.S., Walter, B.A., Architect, Dottie, M.A., Social Worker, and with Ginny, Nurse, Don, Medical Student, John, B.S. Law, and I, it made 14 of us, the seating capacity. Paul, M.S. Social Work, and Bunny, B.S. Engineer, and Shintu, M.A. Engineer, couldn't come. I just asked the kids I liked best. They came over for about an hour, and then we all went to the co-op party at the other house. It was my housewarming, and the kids all raved about the apartment and seemed to enjoy themselves. I had my jack-o'-lantern lit, and John bought me some black and orange candles and Halloween napkins. It was quite a success, and I also enjoyed myself at the co-op party. This morning I taught Sunday school, and this afternoon John came over and helped do the dishes, and then took me to the symphony concert. Strauss waltzes. After he helped me make supper, and now I'm babysitting and watching television. I'm staying until 12.30 a.m. or 1 o'clock, but John's coming to drive me home. He really is a jewel, believe me. He gets nicer every day. Well, I did it. I wrote to Connie and told her to be really sure that England was what she wanted and expected not to hear anything from her. What do you know? She wrote, Boy, what a blast! But is coming next weekend. Her timing is horrible, John said, and so it is. Every weekend has just been loaded with things to do. Not enough time for everything. But next weekend we were planning to do nothing. So Connie's coming and I must arrange things. I'm going to try to talk her into nursing here, getting a job, and sharing the apartment. As Walt says, you won't have to talk anyone into moving here. And Bill said he couldn't understand why he couldn't move in. The co-op has given him the wrong ideas, I think, and he thinks we need a man around. Anyway, John is, turning, is helping me figure out something for next weekend, so hope it all turns out. She gets in Friday night, so I'll have John drive us home after law school. Maybe Dale and Dan will go out with us someplace to dance Friday night. Saturday, I'll have Ginny show her the hospital, and I'll take her to the art museum. I'm trying to get a date for her, and Ginny and Don will go with us to the play Mr. Roberts with Jackie Cooper. Sunday will be church. 
There isn't any s- symphony next Sunday, nor a babysitting with television as I'd planned, but we'll have to figure out something. Wish me luck. I was so thrilled that the kids seemed to like my apartment and party. So long since I had a party of my own, about ten years. And John, and John was just so helpful. He really is wonderful. Dennis's mother is having Miss Bender and I over for dinner Wednesday. I really feel like I've at last found where I belong in Cleveland, at least for now. Oh, John and I were interested in Daddy's letter. Thanks. Our controversy is, does the British have a written constitution like the American? No? I'll write more later. Thanks for the recipes. Goodness, but I I hate it so much when you mix up the pages, and I've made a grand job of that here. I'm sorry. Yes, Daddy, thanks for the letter, and as you said, it was straight off the cuff. The main thing I've learned since coming back to Cleveland is that you have to get things organized in order to get a question answered. Otherwise, you repeat yourself and miss some of the main points. As you suggested, I will have to look it up. This is it. The American government is in three parts, executive, legislative, including the House of Representatives and the Senate, and the judicial. The American Constitution, written, is its foundation. Does Canada have anything equivalent to the Senate? England has the House of Lords. What about Canada? Then the British Constitution is not written, is it? I really believe America has got something. At least they're trying hard to convince me. I love you all and write. Love, Ruthie. 2457 Kenilworth Road, Cleveland Heights, Ohio. November 2nd, 1949. Dearest Mother, Daddy, and Bud, How nice to find your letter when I arrived home, and I'm glad Bud found time to write too. I'm so glad your birthday was nice. I'm glad that you liked the slippers, but wish that you'd mention the bathrobe, as they have them here at $4 and $5. Nice ones, too. The fruitcake arrived yesterday, and when Connie comes, we'll have a little peace. I sort of hope I can talk her into staying, but I suppose after all, the lovely weekends we've had, it'll probably rain. Everything I'd planned has fallen through, the symphony, babysitting, television... And when John went for Mr. Roberts' tickets, they were all sold out, but the $5 box seats, which is too much. However, I have arranged a date. Bob, he's a real swell guy, a medical student, tall, dark, and handsome, and very brilliant. He asked me to go out with him the first Saturday night I was in Cleveland on a double date, Dale with Mike and me with him. Dale... Didn't want to, so he didn't, and the following week I went out with Mike, so Bob didn't ask again. He was really swell when I asked him, so hope Connie enjoys herself. The chocolate soldier will be on, so may be able to see it if it's not too expensive. It's a wonderful world. Miss Bender is coming soon to go to Greenman's for dinner. I just cut up my pumpkin so I can make a pie Friday. I only got a 75 in my sociology text, test, a C. Poor. Ginny has a new iron, so that problem is solved. The big thing is when to get my ironing done. That was so sweet of Joyce, and I must write to Irene and wondering about Marion. One girl in one of my classes whom I like very well came over while I was studying and said, You know, this is so foolish, you and I worrying about exams when we should be married and having babies. I was really quite surprised, and she said, Well, you may not admit it, but you know it's true. That darn tooth, that darn dentist filled, ached all night. Then I slept in because I was so worn out, and Ginny woke me. I phoned Shintu to tell him to have John wait, and felt like Dagwood when I dashed past Ginny, and she handed me a lunch she'd packed. Life. The bus driver, as I came home with the jack-o'-lantern, said, Thought you'd be past that stage by now. We'll try to post Dorothy a card if I remember. Too late. 
my Sunday class, I have seven, all four and five years, five-year-olds. At school, they're mostly six. I'm glad to hear Chris will be back in Hamilton, Ontario. Maybe I can get John to drive me up some weekend. I'm glad you realize that Bud and I hope you get back to school someday. If you're anything like me, you'll appreciate it even more than you would have before. However, I'm glad I can see the end of the degree business because I'd like to get back to taking what I want, art. So glad you have your coronet and hope to send you some of the pieces I like. Thanks so much for the recipes. I will try to bake something before Connie comes. Wish me luck that she likes everything. When everything started to fall through, John said, Well, Red, it may be one of your signs that she shouldn't come to Cleveland. I'm getting so used to him calling me Red when I talk to myself, I catch myself saying, Well, Red, you better get cracking and get to work, which I'd better. You've heard this before, but John really is very nice. I love you all, Ruthie. November 4th, 1949. The first two pages are missing. The editor. Friday after school, Mrs. Heinrichs took some of us to a banquet of the International Council for Exceptional Children, and we went through the Cleveland Bronze and Graphite Factory. It was really an education. Why aren't our schools as beautiful? It was amazing what a lovely factory it is, beautiful grounds, built-in movie for employees, music all day, beautiful cafeteria with lovely map murals, and wonderful restrooms. It just snowed me. I always thought that factories were dungeons, but not this one. We had a lovely little lunch first, punch and canopies and a delicious banquet after, steak, corn, potatoes, and salad, and strawberry shortcake. Did I tell you that I fixed a basket of fruit for the Chinese boy who was sick? He's home now. Yes, air mail is six cents now in the U.S. I got a letter back, so realized it the first week in January. Yes, I have Bud's sock and just must manage to send it. It was such a coincidence you mentioning wallpaper. On the streetcar coming home, I saw a sale of wallpaper on, and some of it looked gorgeous. I thought, why haven't we ever had pretty wallpaper? Is it not practical? So my thoughts went on how I could send some. And on arriving home, your letter mentioning, thinking of getting new wallpaper. Coincidence? Thought transference? Probably it's the first time the thought had ever entered my head. You'd be amazed at a dream John had. I was wondering about his reaction to my fur coat. It is old and rather short, but it's so dear in my heart that I still love it. However, I wondered if I should wear it when I'm going out, when I'm going out with him or not. My problem was solved when he asked, Isn't it a little warm for a fur coat? I didn't wear it. Then we laughed about how in the mornings I hop in and out of the car quite unassisted, but in the evenings wait until he comes around to let me out. Ditto doors. So he, suge he suggested we have a business relationship in the mornings, but in, in the evening we could act like ladies and gentlemen. Well, next morning on the way to school he had us all in stitches, telling about how he dreamed about me all night. In the dream it was summer, but I was wearing my fur coat, and going to school on crutches. He said that some fellow in a big, long, black car was calling for me to take me to school, and all the kids were gathered out the front to watch me and my fur coat and crutches. Then he said he expected the fellow to open the door for me since I was incapacitated, but he didn't. So I broke the window with my crutch and nonchalantly climbed in the window. Then he dreamed that the next day we were going to the same college, Oberlin, and he saw me on the campus and tried to get my attention to ask me why I'd been on crutches, but I'd just smile and go away. When he'd try to follow me, he'd not move forward, but just slip up into the air about eight feet and not get anywhere. Analyze that one? 
Marion says that she's been alone somewhat lately since Jack has been going to Bonspiels. Bon so maybe you'd, you'd call her at school sometime and ask her over. From experience, I know Marion just won't go to see people if she is ever alone unless prevailed upon. I realize so clearly how many more friends I've made since I've come to Cleveland than I ever would with Marion because of that. I enjoy doing things with older women too, not just boys exclusively, and that always seemed to be a waste of time to Marion. Well, darling, I did get a pair of lamps, so all's well. Connie said she saw Daddy and Don at the hockey game, and Marion said she and Jack saw Doug Lane playing one night. I sure am glad about Daddy's classes, and I'm looking forward to hearing some of his stories. I'm really thrilled about Bud's reformation and gaining weight. Bill asked what the, ref what the reforming consisted of, so he's decided to quit smoking too. So Saturday he asked me if he could have one cigarette that night. Did I tell you he told me he was going to marry me? He's going to come back some day when no one else will want me, because I'll be so old after wasting my youth not being serious about anyone. He calls me ugly face and stinker and is always criticizing me like a brother might. Good night. I love you, Ruthie. Cleveland Public Schools, Cleveland, Ohio. Subject, Connie's Visit. November 7th, 1949. Dearest Mother, Daddy, and Bud. Twas a success. You know, it just seemed that everything I planned went wrong, and to top it all, it began to snow Friday morning. The next thing was that I discovered the plane flight had been changed and no letter from her as to her plans. John phoned about three times to learn of developments. I washed clothes, cleaned house, stuffed spare ribs, and baked a pumpkin pie from my jack-o'-lantern. About 6.30, she phoned from downtown, so I went down to meet her. Five minutes later, her, her telegram arrived. We were waiting for a bus when Wayne Duff drove by on the public square and said that John was driving around looking for me. It was such a nice surprise. For the first time, their law school had let out early. John spotted us, and it seemed so lucky with all the traffic downtown. Connie didn't feel like going out Friday night, so John came over after supper and after Connie had had some too, and we talked for a while. Then we drove her to see both co-ops and the Commodore Hotel for a cocktail. Of course, we talked late, and it made me rather homesick to see her. Saturday morning, John came over, waited until we were ready, and drove us to Damon's for lunch. We saw a fashion show there and had a wonderful meal. Connie liked John, and incidentally, he was almost a full-time chauffeur. After lunch, he took us down to the university hospitals, and Ginny showed Connie through while John and I went shopping for groceries. We picked them up and all went downtown. While we shopped, John bought the tickets for the operetta The Chocolate Soldier, and bought himself a green corduroy sport jacket. Then we got home and I made a cheese souffle for supper, and then Bob, Dan, and John came over and we all went to the operetta. It was very good. Afterwards, we all drove out to the Whites and danced till about 2.30. Bob is a nice dancer, and he and Connie seem to be really enjoying themselves. At 2.30, the chimes are supposed to ring and the bar go down. We stayed there to see it, and then it didn't even notice it until it was almost down. Sunday morning I taught Sunday school. Three disliked my black nail polish. John met me after, and we drove over and picked up Ginny and Connie and took them downtown to the cathedral. One of my little boys said, It's a jip. You never walk home with me anymore. Last week you stayed for church. This week you get a ride. So John and I drove him home, plus two others. It was a very good service. Ginny made a very good dinner. Baked ham and pineapple slices, sweet potatoes, frozen peas, cream and creamed onions. 
After dinner, we drove Connie to Ra- Rainbow Children's Hospital, which she seemed to like. Bob came over and drove her out to the airport, so of course she was pretty happy. I think she's going to apply for a visa and apply for a nursing position. I told her she could try to come even if for only a few months and keep her plans of going to England and go for a visit. If she likes Cleveland enough to come back, okay. If she prefers to stay in England, okay too. But I'd like her to have a taste of some fun. She deserves some, and I really think she enjoys herself. I don't know what I've done what I'd have done without Jenny, John, and Bob though. John is so nice, bud. I love you, Ruthie. To be continued. Well that concludes today's presentation. Good luck to you with your efforts in family history if this interests you, finding, preserving, and sharing old letters, diaries, and photographs, and interviewing elderly relatives while they're alive. You might consider checking out our website, Adventures in History, with Peter J. Ray at peterjray.com. Thank you so much for watching. I really appreciate it. God bless you. Take care. And I'll see you next time.